You know, uh, you, you always want to follow somebody that's not that good. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. God is so on her. And it's just so great that we have this uh, um, celebration to, to enjoy together. You may have come to this building today, though, feeling a little heavy or feeling a little sad or a little lonely or a little without hope. And I, I hope that our exuberance in this risen Lord doesn't make you feel like you stumbled into the wrong party. God wants you here with your heaviness, too, with the loads you carry. He wants you here because he wants to help you with that. He wants to help you with everything in your life. And I just want to encourage you today to just be open to him. We all need to repent on a regular basis of depending on ourselves and not God. Today is about that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. We're, we're entering our fourth month of this card that's on your chair next to you. It says, uh, The Hospitality of Jesus. And we're learning what that means. Now, the, this month is the world is waiting. They need the Lord. They need his love, and they need the hospitality of Jesus. And it's going to be uh, something that we cooperate with, and we are led by the Holy Spirit. Easter and the resurrection of Christ changes everything. We've been studying in, the God, in, in Acts chapter uh, 17 is where we're going to be today. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 17, 29 and through 31, we're going to hear what happened. This is about seven years after Jesus rose from the dead. Paul the Apostle is in Athens preaching about Jesus, and, and he's on his missionary journey. He's sharing Christ on the streets. This is where he walked through the town, and he saw all these idols, and he realized, oh, and then in the middle of the town, there's this, this idol that had nothing on it but this inscription to the unknown God. And so he is explaining who this unknown God is. And last week I touched on it a little bit, how, how God is not made by human hands. This is what Paul Apostle said. But he has made everything, and, he, and everything is in him, and the life and breath. Everything we have comes from him. We don't serve him. <laughs> he doesn't need anything. But we are walking with him, and he uses us in this world, and that's true. But he is without need, and we are not. We need God. That's kind of the basics here. And I want us to uh, look at this scripture because the, the Apostle Paul is dealing with some folks there that have some very, um, well, they're kind of steeped in their, in their religious ways. They're kind of in their routine of life, and they're kind of hungry for God. He doesn't attack them for building idols. He just tries to adjust them and, and let them know that their hunger to know is, needs to be directed at the Lord. Okay, so let's, uh, let's read uh, Acts 17, verse 29. This is Paul's speaking to this group in Athens. They had them all gathered around, and he's making his presentation. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, you notice he said we, we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image made by human design and skill. In other words, a God designed by us. Uh, still going on today. There's still folks designing God, trying to make him look how they want him to look. But God is not to be designed by us, okay? Verse 30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent of ignorance. Is that good or not? We get to repent of ignorance. We don't have to stay that way, okay? All right? It's not a life sentence here. All right? From thinking, uh, here's what the ignorance is that we're going to repent of. And we're going to all do this at the end of the service. Not understanding that we are, we are made in God's image. 
and that we are his child. This is something we have to know deep inside, that you are the child of God. And he loves you. And he cares about you. So we're going to repent of that, ignorance of that. In verse 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. And by the one has, he has appointed, he has given proof to this by, to everyone by raising him from the dead. Okay, Paul the Apostle, seven years later, brings up the resurrection of Christ again because this is the, the central point of Christ's ministry and what's separated from all the other so-called messiahs or all so-called leaders is that he rose from the dead and was witnessed by 500-plus people and has, was making impact after his resurrection, okay? And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, this is verse 32, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject, okay? I want to just talk to you about this good news. Alyssa did such a good job preparing you for this. The good news of the gospel is the first, in verse, 30, verse 29, it says, you are God's offspring. You are his offspring. I have a two-month-old grandson named Gabriel. It's what happens when grandpas get old. <laughs> Gabe, the babe. We watch basketball together. He sits in my arm. He falls asleep. He heats me up about 10 degrees. <laughs> it's the best. It's amazing. And if you look at him, he doesn't look anything like me. He, look, yeah. <laughs> he looks like Kevin, his dad. He looks just like him. He's got a big mop of black hair, cute little dimples. Maybe if all his hair fell out and he gained a lot of weight, he'd look like me. <laughs> I can always hope. He's a chip off the old block. People know he's Kevin's and Noel's. That's how it is in family. You know. You know who you are because you're part of the family. I'm the seventh of seven kids. And every one of us seven kids lose their keys all the time. It's a genetic defect. <laughs> it's from being raised in Montana where there's a really good place for keys. It's called the ignition. You leave it in the ignition. Because somebody in the neighborhood may need to borrow your car sometime. It's, I was worried, you know. They, we just don't have crime there, I guess. They do? Well, I'm going to have to do that. I need to find my keys on a regular basis. But I know that when one of my sisters or brothers, I can't find my keys. Whenever a family reunion, everybody, I have about 50% of the time is looking for their keys because they don't have it. It's not in their genetic makeup to handle keys. So we get here in the church, I pull out the keys, Lida says, I give them to her. <laughs> and they'll say when I'm looking for my keys, oh, you're a Pearson. <laughs> you're a Pearson. Can't find his keys. Well, this is how it is with God. We're a chip off the old block. We are a child of God. You have attributes and qualities in you that are from God, your creator. You are his child. He, Paul said, we are his offspring. He's in the middle of Athens preaching to what we would think godless people who were worshiping idols. They said, hey, everybody, we are God's offspring. You have a heart for people who are hurting. That's from God. That comes inside of you because that's what God has created you like. You have a heart for people who are suffering or, or in division or not getting along. And that heart of unity, that's from God. That comes from God into you and to others. You have a, you have a desire to see people in this world succeed and, and be blessed. That's a heart. That's, a, that's an attribute from God that he has given to you. You are his child. You are his kid. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. 
You are his child. Well, wait a minute. I'm not a God. No, you're not God, but you are his child. And he has infused in you part of his nature so that you can reveal who he is to this world. This is the important thing is that you realize that you are his offspring and that God isn't created by you. He has created you. You don't shape, you don't shape a God to fit what you think he looks like. He shapes you. You are his offspring. Well, we need to repent of this ignorance Sometimes we think repentance is such a harsh word, like we have to be really super sorry, hang our heads really super down and, and, and fall on the ground and, and assume the fetal position and groan, okay? Uh, you can repent that way if you want, but that's really not the meaning of repentance. The meaning of repentance is to change a direction, is to go another way, it's to Go this way and repent and go the other way. And so this is what Paul is preaching in verse 29. He says, we need to repent of this where you're making God's look like what you think and understand that God has made you. You are a child of God. You not knowing that and not thinking that and not understanding your value and who you are and how God's created you in his image. You need to repent of that and realize you are his child. I, uh, I'm from Montana, but I'm not much of a hunter. Dave Roberts and I hunted once together. It was the worst day of my life. <laughs> my daughter would say, that's not the worst day. That's a Homer Simpson quote. That's not the worst day of your life, son. It's the worst day of your life so far. Well, anyway. <laughs> Think about that. I would borrow the same gun every year for seven years hunt. And then one year I got an elk. It's my only elk. It is not fun after you shoot an elk. <laughs> All day long, Dave and I drug that elk through deep snow and over a waterfall and down through the trees. And Dave fell on his back and the gun was pinned behind him in the, in the snow and there's his little face sticking out and an elk just came rushing down and a dead one and put his and put his feet right there on Dave, and he goes, Joe, Joe, can you help me up? So <laughs> at the end of our two-day excursion of getting this, we got a little box of meat, little tiny box <laughs> of meat. $873 a pound is what that meat <laughs> costs. <laughs> Way up in the mountains, up in the mountains. We, I, there's a guy in Oregon named Gary Keeper that I bought Christmas trees once when we were going broke farming. That's what you do. You start doing other things. And uh, I sold Oregon Christmas trees out there. And uh, he said, could you take me hunting sometime? <laughs> it's like he doesn't know who he's asking. But anyway, I took him, I took him up, and we, went, we rented. We didn't rent horses. They, we had an outfitter, and we rode the horses on the switchbacks going up the Great Divide above Above Shoto and the Swift Dam, there you go. The horse paths are cut into the side of the mountain, little switchbacks back and forth. That's the where you keep the foot on the downward side loose in the stirrup. In case the horse goes over, you just jump off. So we get way up into the 7,000 feet up here. And some of those peaks are 10,000 feet, but we're cresting over into the great divide of this continent, the continental divide, and we're at the very top. And he stops and he says, look at this, guys. Then we look east and we just see brown and where the rivers flow is green all around rivers. But you look to the west and you see almost to Oregon. It's just mountain after mountain after mountain. You can't see anything but just wilderness as far as you can see, the Bob Marshall wilderness. And we're up there and he starts to talk about the watershed. He says, do you know that some of the rain here that falls on this area, some of this rain ends up going down into the Missouri River and it feeds into the Mississippi and ends up into the Gulf of Mexico. And yet, just a few feet away, some of the rain falls here or the snow melts and it, it drifts over here and goes down into the Snake River, over into the Columbia and out to the Pacific Ocean. This, he said, is a watershed. 
It's where the water divides. It's a direction that the water chooses because it's on this side or it's on this side. Paul the Apostle is there, and he says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at that, some of them sneered and went this way. And at that, some of them said, I want more of this. I want to know. And so this is what repentance is. It's, it's following the Lord in the direction he wants you to go. It's not going the way you think you want to go. But listening to him, he, he, res he resurrected for me. He loves me. I'm going to follow him. You don't have to understand it all. And they didn't understand it all. But they just said, I want you to hear, speak more about this resurrection. And they followed Paul and they listened to him some more. But this is a watershed moment. You're going to have watershed moments all through your life where you're going to decide whether or not to trust Jesus. Or whether or not you're going to go back and make some kind of little image to worship. Am I going to follow the resurrected Christ? Like these folks did at baptism. It's a watershed moment. They decided to follow Jesus. But there's more coming. More decisions coming to follow him every day. It's not a once and done deal. We choose to go the direction of Christ. And serve him and follow him. And receive and believe that he was resurrected. And that's, that's a choice. That's a decision. You can sneer at it. Or you can follow him and learn more. Verse 31, he says, Paul says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. By the one he has appointed, this Jesus, he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. <laughs> when some of them heard about this, Resurrection of the dead. Some of them sneered, but others said, we, we want to hear more about this. Because you know what? It does make sense. I'm just filling in what was maybe in their mind. It does make sense that this isn't everything. That there is an eternity here. That we're walking around with the Spirit of God in us. We have this personality in us. This, it doesn't make any sense that this is the end of it. What makes sense is that God has put life in you, creative life. God has created you in his image to follow him and to understand who he is. Matthew 28. I'm just going to read the resurrection story. After the Sabbath... This was Sunday, on the dawn of the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene, who had been forgiven of so much, and the other Mary, went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the, the, the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They passed out. It's too much. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you, you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. Come and see the place where he, he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him. And now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb. Afraid yet filled with joy. This is how it feels when we follow Christ. Afraid yet filled with joy. This is how it is when you're on the watershed and you decide uh, this easy way or no, I'm going to go the way Jesus wants me to go. Ah! You're afraid yet filled with joy because you know it's right. But just embrace it. It's like roller coaster fear. It's like, oh. Woo! <laughs> you know, you're just stomachs turning and you're like in line and the line's going too fast. And, oh no, get on. Woo! These women went after Jesus. They were afraid and very excited. That's a way to live life. You know you're alive then, see? Okay. 
afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. And suddenly, <laughs> Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. <laughs> then they came to him, collapsed at his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And so seven years later, Paul brings up the resurrection. 2,000 years later, I bring it up. This resurrection, is it true? Is it real? Yes. And when we die, he brings justice to this world, and everything is made right. There's a time. There's a time. Paul said there's a time right here. He said there's a time when Jesus is going to come, and that God has called him to bring justice to this world and universe everything's going to be right right now there's some stuff that's wrong right there's some stuff that you are disappointed in you came to church with some stuff that's you're dealing with there's there's issues there's all that stuff but there is a justice coming there's a time coming when jesus will make everything right that's a good thing that's the gospel you may have some struggles here but it is compares to nothing, Paul the Apostle said, compared to the eternity we have with Christ. The troubles we have, <laughs> I know they're tough, and we feel bad for you, and we feel bad for each other, and we there's a lot of feeling bad going on in the world. But like Jacob said when he started church, you know, I, oh well, Jesus was raised from the dead. I mean, it's like worst case scenario, I'm eternally with him. Okay, that brings us perspective. And Jesus has set that day when it'll be all made right. Maybe it's when I'm with the Lord. Maybe it's maybe when he returns and says, I've had enough of this. I want to go into the new age when everything's, I don't know, but your spirit and my spirit and God's Holy Spirit is going to all be together around those who love him for eternity because we are God's children. So let's repent today. I'm not wanting you to feel bad, but I'm wanting you to go a good direction. Maybe, maybe you've been trying to make this thing up on your own, and you've tried to make it happen. You've tried to make it work. And maybe you just need to repent of that and say, God, I'm done trying to fashion you. Would you shape me? I am your child. I want to be like you. I want to. I want your Holy Spirit to bring out those attributes in me, the family traits of being your child to this lost world. Let's bow our heads. Jesus, we need you for this. Thank you for raising from the dead. Thank you that we're not like just imagining some hopeful story, but the reality that you have risen from the dead and that we embrace you and, and we ask you to save us and to come into us by your spirit. Would you with me pray a prayer out loud? Just repeat it with me, a, a prayer of repentance. Dear Lord Jesus, we repent of our ways. We want to follow your ways. Thank you for being our Lord and our Savior. Walk with us as we journey on. We follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. The reality of our resurrected Lord is that he is ever present in our time of need. He's here for us. He doesn't just go away. We're here. He's here. Okay? I just feel like there might be somebody that needs God to do intervene in something in their life. You were like, I got to have some help here, God. I've got a situation I'm dealing with. If that's you, would you raise your hand? We're going to pray together as we close. That's all we're going to do. And just raise your hand and keep it up so people can see around you. If you could just uh, see somebody next to you, would you uh, reach your hand over there and pray for them? Anybody else that you might have missed it? You want to raise your hand for some prayer? We won't close, okay? <laughs> Jesus, thank you for being here. 
Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Would you now rest with each person that raised their hand? Would you give them what they need, Lord, as they follow you, as they lean into you for this need? Would you just give them your comfort by your Holy Spirit and your direction? Thank you, God, that as we follow you, we don't follow just an idea. We follow you, Lord, our, our personal Savior. Thank you for being the personal Savior for each of these needs here today that raise their hands. Would you bless them with the answers they need and the direction they need? Would you just intervene by your Holy Spirit so they would know it's you talking to them, that there's not something that they've just imagined? Lord, would you talk to them by your Holy Spirit? Would you intervene now in your precious name? Lord, we need you to lead all of us as we go from here. That this world that we live in would hear you and know you and, and follow you. So we ask that you would use us to share the gospel of who you are and the truth. In your name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. I'm so glad you're here. And uh, have a good Easter. If there's any other needs or prayer, you can